Thank you. Pleasure to be here in Paris. And uh, when I find out what you said, I'll uh, get even. Thank you. I apologize. My uh, French is not good. OK, so let's get started. The topic is brain-computer interfaces. And the question is, how do we interact with computers? At the moment, computers present us with information and we respond with some kind of control mechanism and uh, we select information. Effectively, it's a master-slave relationship. And in fact, we all know who the master is in this relationship because the computer defines the rules. How do we interact with other humans? Completely different. You can see in this picture a couple of humans interacting. There's an awful amount of subtext. More than 80% of the communication is nonverbal. I'm not entirely sure what's going on there, but I know the guy's in trouble. <laughs> is there a way to interact with computers in the same way that we interact with humans? Well, not yet, but we're working on it. And uh, the best form of controller is this one. If we can manage to pick out information from this piece of jelly that we all have inside our heads and transfer it to the computer in some way that the computer can understand, then we're another step along the way. In particular, a lot of the communication that is uh, passed between humans is this nonverbal uh, stuff, which is based on emotions and reactions, nothing that you can get through a normal computer interface. The adult human brain, a bit over a kilogram, there's about 170,000 kilometers of neurons, and there are billions of junctions. It's a massive computer, and it's uh, very complicated, and there are very tiny electrical junctions. Each electrical junction is uh, between a neuron and an adjacent neuron, and there are little dendrites off each neuron, and they connect with thousands of other neurons, millions of, in some cases. And, uh, the communication is, is chemical, but what is generated is a small electrical charge each time there's a, there's a um, signal fires from one neuron to the next. And generally, when you observe the behavior of the brain, you see uh, there are waves of activity that, uh, that move around. And uh, this is related to processes. It's, it's kind of like things moving around in a computer. You could see information, trace it. It's much more complex in, in, the, uh, in the brain. All of the interaction takes place over a very thin layer on the outside of the cortex, so just maybe the outer millimetre or two of the, of the brain actually does all of the thinking. Deeper in the brain is for communication, generation of hormones, uh, emotional responses, pretty much the more primitive uh, aspects. We can actually detect quite a bit of what's going on in the brain by putting some electrodes on the outside of the surface of the skin, and we can detect gross electrical behaviour. Uh, the uh, signals inside the head uh, for the geeks in the audience are of the order of a volt, a tenth of a volt to one volt. On the outside of the skin, we're measuring microvolts. So it takes an awful lot of uh, activity on the outside to generate, uh, takes an awful lot of activity inside the head to generate enough signal on the outside of the head to be able to detect. So we're detecting gross trends in the electrical behavior. And this is a this technology we have is based on the electroencephalogram, which is a, a effectively a medical technology that's been around for maybe 80 years or so. So here we see the brain with the waves of activity floating around over the surface. And this is the way it's typically picked up. Masses of electrons, uh, of electrodes, and we can see there are plenty of cables hanging off the back of the head. Uh, in a medical situation, this is maybe an overkill situation. You would probably have 64 sensors on the uh, typical medical EEG system. Uh, each individual sensor needs to be placed by a technician. It can take two to three hours to be set up in a medical uh, situation. And the cables across the back end are also a problem. You're tethered to a machine which is recording information. You're not free to move around. So, for example, if you're being um, diagnosed with epilepsy, you'll be uh, taken into a hospital, you'll be kitted up with, uh, with an EEG system, you'll uh, be tied to a machine, you won't be able to leave your hospital bed, you can't shower, and they need to sit there and observe you for about a week to be sure that you 
do or do not have epilepsy. So if a seizure occurs sometime in that week, you're definitely diagnosed. Otherwise, they're not sure, but they're fairly sure after a week. Um, but just to diagnose epilepsy, that's a fairly, fairly restrictive and expensive way of, uh, of doing it. It would be much better if you could walk around at home with a little monitor stuck to your head. So there is an alternative, and I'm actually wearing one. And this much more good-looking guy is also wearing one. Uh, much lower density of sensors, you'll notice. Um, for practical purposes, it's not really possible to put that many sensors on a head. Uh, quite a few aspects to the design. This, this design is actually designed to be one, uh, one size fits all. So whatever shape or size your head is, this device will, will actually accommodate. And each individual arm is on a spring, so it's like independent suspension. If I clench my teeth, the thing doesn't fall off, I can move my head around. So we've made it very lightweight also, so there's no inertia. And with this device, this is actually a medical program which is recording, um, it's actually doing a localization. Uh, this is like a, a low resolution tomography of the brain from the electrical signals. This is also slowed down 100 times, so you can actually see the waves of activity moving around the brain very rapidly. And uh, this device has the resolution to pick that up. So what do your brain waves look like? Uh, can we switch to this machine, please? OK. Complete mess. You'll notice that as I blink my eyes, there are a couple of uh, things going on. As I clench my teeth or talk or move around, there's quite a lot of noise gets into these signals. But this is actually recording my brain waves in real time, and this signal is pretty much uh, medical standard. You can see that my brain actually does work, more or less, even though I'm a bit jet lagged. And uh, the important thing to note also is that there are some significant artifacts in there like that one. When I clench my teeth, the muscle activity generates a lot, of, uh, a lot of electrical signals outside the skull, and this tends to pollute the signal. So that can cause us some problems. OK. Um, an interesting question is, oh, let me just show you one other feature of this headset. This is a two-axis gyro. I just threw that one in for the geeks also. We can detect X and Y direction of the, of the head movement. That's not EEG, but that's just, uh, just an additional uh, feature for the, uh, for the device. OK, so what does that mess of activity sound like? I guess we don't have the sound working there. Never mind. It was an interesting demo. Sounds like a complete, oh, there we go. So this is the sound of my brain. This is actually the, the frequencies of all the brain waves brought up into the audible range so that you can hear them. And you'll notice that as I move around, think different things, the pattern's changed a little bit. It gives us some sort of uh, leverage to get in there and figure out what's going on, but it is a hell of a mess. OK, so what can we do with this thing? Well, we've actually developed some software at the bottom end which uh, will detect what's going on. And you'll notice the first thing here is that this device is mimicking my facial expression. You saw the, uh, the noise artifacts in the signals which were resulting from facial expressions. Uh, so basically muscle activations. We have enough resolution with the number of sensors that we have to actually determine which muscles are moving and from that we can extract some facial expressions. And uh, we can even do some cute things with it. That's my friend Emobot. I'd like to think I could go now after the applause, but we have a little way to go yet. 
Okay, this is the embarrassing part. This is where I actually show you how I'm feeling. So the black curve up here is showing my live excitement level. The blue curve is my frustration level. <laughs> the red curve is showing how engaged or uh, active I am in uh, thinking about things, so I'm pretty, pretty chilled out. The green curve is my meditation level. Uh, the orange curve down the bottom is actually my um, long-term excitement level, so I'm, I'm pretty well uh, hyped up about this talk. Uh, and if I think about um, maybe going to the Moulin Rouge, my wife is in the audience, um, <laughs> so my frustration level goes up along with my excitement level. <laughs> But the real magical part of this device is, uh, is this part. This is where we can actually train the system to recognize specific uh, mental commands. What I'll do is show you, I'll make a brand new profile. So this machine now knows nothing whatsoever about me. And uh, this is how long it takes to teach it to do a mental action. So let's just decide on a, on a lift. Okay, the first thing I have to do is train the system to recognize when I'm not thinking about anything. It has an awful lot of that data available because I'm not thinking about things quite a lot of the time. Then I'm going to show it how I want to achieve a mental lift. So when I start training, Okay, and now knows what I want to do. So that's about 16 seconds worth of training. I don't need to use my hand. Maybe I do. Okay, we usually use the hand just to show that the demonstration isn't a fake. switch back to my other profile, which I hope works. I'll just show you something that we've actually attached to this. Okay, so you can see the cube there. So it's quite a simple application, tone generator, linked up to the, uh, to the cognitive suite, which is what we call the mental commands. So I can make music with my brain. There are a lot, of, a lot more things that we can do with that, but uh, I think we'll get back into the talk and we'll, uh, we'll show you a little bit more about that. Okay, so can we switch back to the uh, slides, please? Do I have to do it mentally? Okay, so we've seen what the brain waves look like. We've even heard what the brain waves sound like, if you could hear them. They are actually very low frequency. Uh, the highest frequency that we measure is about 50 hertz, which is barely audible. So they were multiplied up into the 300 hertz range, so you could hear them. So what could we do with this thing? You've seen a couple of examples already. In gaming, we can do things like animate uh, a character, as you saw. Uh, we can do things like adjust the difficulty of the game dynamically. So we can detect when people are getting frustrated, when they're getting bored with the game. Uh, we can basically make the game more reactive to them so that they're not overly challenged and they're not also bored. Or you can play with them. You can do things like deliberately make them bored and then frighten them by giving them a, uh, a, sudden, a sudden shock of some sort by maybe being attacked by a large number of nasties or uh, something else. You can actually direct your user through a particular emotional experience in the game. 
Uh, you can even do things like maybe you could um, build a game based on the Incredible Hulk where he must get excited to change into the Hulk and he must calm down to change back from the Hulk when the police are coming. So that's the kind of thing you can do. You can manipulate the user's mood in a lot of ways. Uh, you can force them to relax or you can actually do things like magic spells, as you saw, and something I didn't show you, you can actually link this up to existing games. So we can link any of the actions and facial expressions to keystroke sequences which are sent to other applications. So if you have a game that requires you to type a C to cast a spell, you can make the headset cast a spell just by thinking about the spell, and that actually brings some value back to your back catalogue of games. I've seen hardcore gamers uh, playing Harry Potter for hours on end with tears in their eyes with a headset on, and they would have tears in their eyes if you made them play for an hour without the headset. Okay, so we can use and enhance existing applications of many sorts. So that, that capability, uh, for example, here. Uh, on the left screen, we have actually a model which is uh, built in Rhino, and uh, there's a parametric modeling program behind that. So this is a real engineering program. And the headset, you can see over on the right-hand side there, is linked to a, an Excel spreadsheet on the top, changing a cell value and the cell value is changing parameters actually in the model. So it's possible to do real design with your head. You can think that I don't, I don't particularly like that shape, let me change the shape. Okay, a lot more exciting applications uh, in, uh, with disabled people. So mobility, for example. Uh, this is one of our uh, developers. Most of our developers are independent, by the way. They're just people who bought the uh, software development kit. And uh, this guy's no exception. He's built his own uh, software to interface. Uh, the next couple of sections are for the geeks. Uh, there's an Arduino board. Another board, very geeky. Sorry, bosses. And that's hooked up to the, uh, to the control on an electric wheelchair. And just by thinking, uh, the guy in the wheelchair could go forward or backwards, sideways. Uh, it's a slight impediment to have to carry the computer at the moment, but obviously that's, uh, that's something that could be resolved quite easily. In fact, we're working on a, on a board that's about 75 millimetres by 40 millimetres. That will replace the entire PC. Uh, able gaming is another area where disabled people can benefit significantly from this headset. They can actually play games with other gamers on an equal footing because they don't have to use their controllers. The fact that they can't hit a fire key as quickly as somebody else is, uh, is no impediment to them, so they're actually capable of doing that. Uh, it's also got uh, some unexpected rehabilitative uh, qualities, as I'll just show you here. This is the story of a young lady who was actually badly injured in a car accident in 2001. She's now quadriplegic. Think about lifting up just like he did. <laughs> so this was the first time she's actually been able to achieve any physical action outside of moving her own head. Uh, for about uh, nine years. And uh, she refused to put the rock down. So you could, you'll also notice that the, the carer is holding her head upright. There's not actually anything wrong with her neck muscles, but she's just been depressed and not actually involved and tends to let her neck muscles atrophy. Three weeks later, after playing quite a few sessions with the game, uh, you can probably see, I'm not sure whether you could see her down the bottom there. This is actually one of the games that we ship with a headset. Uh, you'll notice also in the background, uh, the sky colour will change depending on her excitement level. Uh, and the music volume is adjusted to the excitement level. Uh, an important thing to note is that Cora is actually holding her head upright and she was not able to do that for about nine years. Uh, 
She just had the incentive to sit there and play that, and her, her eyes are actually focused on the monitor as well. Generally, she was just gazing around. So she's actually found a new interest. She's able to do something, and a positive benefit is that she now has full control over her neck muscles, and that will actually leverage the gyro in the, in the headset. She can then start to play games with the gyro. One of the problems that the carer had was that she insisted on as soon as she could lift something, she would keep lifting it and she wouldn't move on to the next part of the game. Uh, this is another, uh, another system based on motor imagery in this case. Uh, in fact, one of the sensors on the top of the head, uh, this is the motor cortex across the middle of the head, it's actually the imagination of making the, making the hand action. It's, uh, the, the hand isn't actually responding to the muscle movements in the hand. Uh, in fact, there was another, um, another section on this video where the guy was just visualising moving his hand and that was enough. Uh, it's not something that you would probably sell as, a, as an orthosis, orthosis control system yet, but uh, it's getting close. What else? Well, there's flying. Let's start out with a little bit of virtual flying. This is a fantastic French uh, quadricopter, the AR drone. Uh, it's remote controlled, and this guy has linked it through uh, the Linux version of the SDK uh, to control where the little uh, quadricopter flies. It has a streaming camera. You can see the cube moving in the background and the, uh, and the helicopter is, is following the movements. Okay, you'll never get me up in one of those, you might say. Well, this young lady is about to fly in a harness. But the motion of the harness is completely controlled by the headset. The room that she's in is actually a massive uh, virtual reality room. Uh, there are TV monitors over every wall, the floors and the ceiling, and uh, they can actually put you into a virtual environment. So uh, when, when I see the next video here, she will really be flying through a, a virtual landscape. Uh, as I said, you probably still won't get me up in one of those. Okay, what other crazy things can we do? Well, neuromarketing is a, is a growing field. It had a little bit of a, um, a burst about um, year 2000 and went away for a while. What we now have are the tools to actually do this kind of thing. So you'll see it in the top there's a, uh, a movie clip and the little orange dots are an eye tracker so the, uh, the people doing the assessment of the video know where people are looking. Down the bottom there is actually a... Um, a three-dimensional, well, two-dimensional map of the uh, activity in the brain in four of the major uh, activity bands. So there's the delta band, theta band, alpha band, gamma band, and also the uh, emotional uh, detections that you can see there. So the person analysing the video clip to see whether it's worth releasing to the public knows where the person is looking and how they're feeling about what they're looking at. So that's much more um, information than they had before. Generally with an eye tracking system you know that people are staring at something, it may be because they love it, maybe because they're just horrified and there's no real way of detecting the difference. That's possible now. The other thing is that you can tell that this is a girl who was wearing the headset just from the eye tracking but we won't go back. Okay, we can do other things like index and search by emotions. So this is... Uh, I think we've lost the sound again. There we go. This is an application that somebody made. We 
where emotional responses are tracked through an entire video. This book was about 10 minutes long. I can create bookmarks and use the power of digital search to turn the computer into a silicon extension of my memory. I'll start thinking of the scary part of the video where the baby dragon was snatched away from our heroine by the adult dragon. As my fear washes over me, the fear meter rises. Once it reaches a certain intensity, the system will react and take me to that spot in the video. So you can imagine doing that with your entire video collection, your iPod, your music collection, uh, photographs on your, on your uh, PC. You can actually go through and emotionally index them all and you might decide that you want to look at only happy photographs or sad photographs or whatever on a particular occasion. It's just another tag that you can put into a search engine and, and use it to go and find things. How about driving a car, all right? <laughs> Presents. These guys are German. In this video, we're going to show you how to control a car using brain sensors. On the left is our car. On the right, you can see the EEG sensors used for measuring brain activity. For a second experiment, we trained the computer to recognize four brain patterns. The test subject can steer the car to the left or the right. He can also accelerate or decelerate the car. Of course, you should never try this at home. For safety reasons, we tested in a large open space at Tempelhof Airport in Berlin. You can see here the test subject incrementing or decrementing the steering angle. There's a slight delay between the brain command and the steering action. Genes with our brains. Anton Domasch and I approved this message. This research has been brought to you by Autonomous Labs at the Free University of Berlin. So there are many other applications for this kind of technology. Uh, we have uh, applications in medicine. I mentioned earlier uh, the detection of epilepsy. Uh, there are many characteristic brain patterns that determine that there's a seizure happening uh, or that indicate a seizure, and this level of, uh, of density of sensors is more than enough to detect that. Uh, there are people working uh, actually at Harvard Medical School on early detection of autism in young children. and. Uh, Again, there are characteristic EEG signatures for many things, and autism is one of them. And basically, if you can intervene with a child before they uh, try to socialise, if, if they're autistic, you can actually make a much better outcome for them. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity for uh, treating mood disorders and bio using them for biofeedback. So mood disorders, people maybe have uh, anxiety or depression. You can actually put... Uh, under medical supervision, of course, you can develop games or applications that the wearer must go through each day, and their emotional reactions to the to the process give you an indication of how they uh, how they're feeling, where they are in their cycle, whether they need more medication, less medication. Uh, they can actually learn to to cope with their own anxiety through biofeedback methods. So. You can detect whether they're anxious and you can provide them with stimuli and, and a learning environment that will, uh, will actually help, uh, help them to progress. Uh, you can monitor post-trauma or uh, after a stroke. So, for example, if you bash your head on the football field, uh, at the moment somebody looks into your eyes, sees whether you can follow their finger or not, sends you back out on the field. In this case, you can actually put a headset on somebody in a matter of a, about 30 seconds you can run a series of tests and actually detect whether they, they're suffering from concussion or not. Uh, after a stroke, it's also uh, quite possible to monitor whether there's any progression of the stroke. You can look at the areas that are damaged already and see whether the, the uh, stroke progression is, uh, is happening or not, whether the medication is making any difference. Uh, telemedicine is another example of what can be done, home care and uh, medicine in the developing world. So those, those topics are pretty much um, pretty much merged together. The device is very cheap. It costs about $300 US for, a, um, for this headset. It's wireless. It's battery operated. It can be fitted by the user. And it can link up to, uh, say, a cell phone, where um, one of the tragedies of the modern world is that in places where there's no medical care and no fresh water, there's still usually very good mobile phone coverage. Um, and it's possible to have maybe a nurse or a, um, just a trained assistant go out, fit this to people in the field, 
and uh, it's cheap enough that it can be deployed massively and the data can be sent back to a, to a specialist uh, somewhere else in the world. Uh, there are applications in learning. So, for example, if you want to achieve some accelerated training, you can track whether people are engaged by the material. In fact, I can probably pick that uh, if people were wearing the headset now, I'd see high levels of boredom in the, in the audience, and I could change my material a little bit. Um, I can adjust things to keep people engaged and maybe make sure that they understood what was going on. Uh, it's also very good for training children with attention deficit disorder. You can, uh, you can track what's going on when they start to get bored with the material. You give them something else to do. You can provide them with rewards, so the, uh, the system maybe will allow them to do another cognitive action, give them another magic spell. They can go and play a game with a headset, that kind of thing. Uh, transportation safety is another area that's, uh, that's interesting. Um, you can tell whether a driver is fatigued, you can tell whether an air traffic controller is asleep, although that's usually fairly, fairly simple. You just listen for the sound of crashing planes. Uh, pilot assistive technology is another area. Um, particularly in uh, jet fighters and uh, even in modern airliners, the pilot just has an incredible array of things that they have to do at once and their hands are usually fairly occupied to be able to switch between information screens even just using a simple um, mind control method uh, would it just gives them another, uh, another lever on controlling the aeroplane and they can switch between levels of information that they want. And uh, finishing just a little early, uh, but that's the, uh, that's the headset on a much better looking model than myself. And there's our website and my favourite button is the buy now. This is actually commercially available. Thank you. And, uh, leave a little time for questions. Sure. Thank you very much for, for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, does it make a difference whether the subject has a little of a lot of hair or not a lot of hair, is sweating or not sweating, does it make a difference in the signal? First question. And the mm -hmm. second question is, uh, would it be feasible to use magnetoencephalography instead of electroencephalography to get a better signal? Uh, both very good questions. Um, the first question is about the level of hair. In fact, um, my, uh, my boss is a young Vietnamese woman who has incredibly dense hair. We have people in our, uh, in our company who have dreadlocks. Uh, we have demonstrated the system to over a thousand people at trade shows where people will just walk up and we've never had anybody who had hair that was bad enough to stop it. We actually use a small amount of saline in the, in the uh, sensors, so each, each sensor is a little felt pad with a little bit of salt water in it. Basically, if you have enough, um, if you have enough salt water there, it will penetrate through the hair and, and reach the scalp. Uh, perspiration can cause issues, but uh, generally we haven't found it an issue, and I've been sweating pretty heavily today, I can tell you. <laughs> uh, it doesn't seem to make much difference. Uh, magnetic sensors, it's possible to use magnetic sensors. Uh, they're much more complicated. Uh, we find that the range that you have to hold the magnetic sensor over is, uh, is very critical, so it's, it's uh, similar to capacitive sensors. The, the detection is, um, is quite critical. Uh, the mechanical structure is critical also, and magnetic sensors tend to be more expensive than simple electrical sensors, which just go straight to, a, straight to an input amplifier. But uh, in general, yes, it's quite possible to use magnetic sensing, and it's even possible to use infrared sensing and look at blood flow. Um, so there are alternatives to EEG. Mm -hmm. Sure. Hi. Um, how, do, how long do you think it will be, be before it gets shipped with uh, game consoles or such devices? Uh, I'd like to think it'll be soon. It's already shipping. Uh, we have the device for sale to consumers for use on PCs. Uh, it's just really a question of getting one of the bigger gaming companies to take the product up and build it into a, into a game. Uh, at the moment, we're in the early stages of building a, an installed base so that the larger companies will be interested. Uh, right now, I think it's not difficult to integrate with a Kinect and an Xbox. Uh, 
the, the system works on Linux, uh, so it used to work on uh, PlayStation, but not yet, uh, not anymore. But uh, yeah, Sony, Microsoft, and Nintendo all have systems, and they're all looking at them. So I can't tell you how long it'll be before they do anything, but uh, they'll have to be convinced that it's a it's a workable technology, and it will be mass uh, have enough mass appeal. Mm -hmm. Hi. Uh, got two related questions. Um, sure. You were talking about air pilots, so how sensible is it, it is to disruptions? Uh, meaning, I'm doing something like you know uh, managing my stick and thinking about moving something and doing a second operation in parallel. So I guess the brain is thinking about both. Yes. You know. Mm -hmm. So how does it work? And I forgot my second question. So <laughs> start with the first one. Would you like to borrow the headset? <laughs> uh, yes, it, it's it's a question of training. So um, it, it's uh, similar to trying to drive a car or, or um, operate a wheelchair. You need to you need to be able to separate all the different functions. And uh, when you actually get used to the cognitive suite, it's very similar to moving a limb. You you actually learn to do things subconsciously. It's almost like a muscle memory. Uh, so it's just almost like an extra hand. Uh, it takes maybe 20 or 30 hours of training to get to that level. But. Oops, sorry. Yeah, my second question was uh, how reactive it is. Uh, you know, uh, in games, you want the stuff to react as fast as possible. And it was an issue sure. for like uh, motion sensors. So I'm wondering about uh, this technology. Yeah, we don't we don't foresee the, ga the the headset being used for twitch reactions, so things like firing a weapon uh, rapidly. It's uh, it's got a lag of about a quarter of a second uh, at least, and that's probably much worse than a than a finger twitch. I, I think the average uh, the average gamer gets down to about 100 milliseconds, so you won't take on a gamer at that rate. Uh, However, uh, for many other things like entering stealth mode, switching weapons, aiming cameras, aiming weapons, uh, it's, got, uh, it's got an awful lot. So, so much more for role-playing games uh, where you're a wizard walking around doing things, that, that kind of thing. So if you're looking at uh, 100 millisecond timing, then this is probably not yet the technology. <laughs> there are methods that can be used with EEG, uh, evoke response potentials that have faster response times. Um, they're computationally more intensive, and we're waiting for Moore's law to allow us to uh, to present those options as well. I think we have time for just last one question. Hello. Hi. Um, is it possible with your device to induce feelings instead of uh, just sensing it? Uh, the device is read-only, but uh, as we all know with, feed with feedback systems, it is in fact possible to react to something and control it by providing an external stimulus that maybe can control how people are feeling. So this is, this is one way that people are looking at controlling anxiety or depression with this kind of device. So they'll actually detect that you're getting into that spiral and then they'll present stimuli that continue to change until they find one that... Uh, that takes you back out of the mood. And if you can do that with anxiety or depression, you can do it with any other mood, of course. Uh, so even though the device is read-only, we all know about feedback. Thank you.